So we are going to listen to some more pivotal moments from today's hearing throughout the program. In her opening testimony, Christine Blasey Ford described the alleged attack and why she didn't tell her story publicly until years later. Let's hear what she told the lawmakers. Brett's assault on me dra drastically altered my life. For a very long time, I was too afraid and ashamed to tell anyone these details. I did not want to tell my parents that I, at age 15, was in a house without any parents present, drinking beer with boys. I convinced myself that because Brett did not rape me, I should just move on and just pretend that it didn't happen. Over the years, I told very, very few friends that I had this traumatic experience. I told my husband before we were married that I had experienced a sexual assault. I had never told the details to anyone, the specific details, until May 2012 during a couple's counseling session. My husband recalls that I named my attacker as Brett Kavanaugh. After that May 2012 therapy session, I did my best to ignore the memories of the assault because recounting them caused me to relive the experience and caused panic and anxiety. Occasionally, I would discuss the assault in an individual therapy session, but talking about it caused more reliving of the trauma, so I tried not to think about it or discuss it. But until July 2018, I had never named Mr. Kavanaugh as my attacker outside of therapy. This changed in early July 2018. I saw press reports stating that Brett Kavanaugh was on the short list of a list of very well qualified Supreme Court nominees. I thought it was my civic duty to relay the information I had about Mr. Kavanaugh's conduct so that those considering his nomination would know about this assault. So we take a closer look at this extraordinary day with three people who've been here all day as part of our live coverage of the hearing. Elizabeth Holtzman, who served four terms in Congress representing the state of New York. She was a Democratic member of the House Judiciary Committee and later served as the district attorney in Brooklyn. She's now a private attorney, and her book, The Case for Impeaching Trump, will be released next month. Amy Walter of the Cook Political Report and Michael Gerson is a columnist for The Washington Post. He also worked as a speechwriter for President George W. Bush at the same time Brett Kavanaugh served in the White House. Welcome back to all of you. We've been together all day long. <laughs> Quite a now day. it's the news hour. Uh, it's, it's real. Uh, Amy, just getting back to how uh, Christine Blasey Ford introduced herself, it seems to me she was in many ways trying to, what was coming across was a genuine, sincere, effort to explain why she did this and that it wasn't politically motivated, which is what the Republicans are saying. This is somebody nobody had seen before, had never heard her speak before. We had only seen what had been reported in the news um, reports. And this is someone who came across as very genuine, as very real. As Lisa pointed out, she's not very familiar with the ways of Washington. She was unfamiliar with some of the questions. But you walked away thinking this is somebody who does not, uh, was not interested in trying to make a broader case against uh, the system. She was there because of what had happened to her. And as we noted here, she opened by saying, when I saw his name on the short list, yeah. that's when I, uh, that's when I uh, came forward. But it was pretty clear as well as she was getting questioned not again by the Republican senators, but by the person that they had selected to do the questioning, that the case they were trying to make was whether or not she was genuine in her recollection mm -hmm. and whether or not she had ul ulterior motives. And neither of those things uh, came through. And Michael Gerson, how did she do at trying to come across as genuine and real? Well, I think the advantage was she didn't try to come across. She was <laughs> actually genuine and real. Mm -hmm. um, you know. It, it, was she plausible? Yes, I think she was absolutely plausible. Was she moving? Yes, she was very moving. Um, and I, at the end of that testimony, you had the emotional feel, or I did, that this may be over um, mm -hmm. because of the way that she had, had done. Um, she simply did not look like she was trying to 
be a part of some larger political cause, whatever it was, even the Me Too movement. It was about her mm -hmm. and her story, and it seemed quite authentic. And so I, I think it was an excellent performance precisely because it was not a performance. And, and it came, Liz Holtzman, in the middle of this very political environment we were in. It was, if, it was as if here's a real human moment in the middle of something that's become very political. Right, and, and I agree with my two colleagues here. She was very authentic. She was um, disarming because she had no motive. She, she was humble. She wasn't arrogant, and she talked about uh, trying to make civic duty, her civic duty in coming forward, to try to help the committee make the right decision. She wasn't anti-conservative people on the Supreme Court. She wasn't pro them. She just wanted this person, the, the committee, the president, to understand what he had done in her view, I mean, the allegation. So I thought she was very, very strong and um, convincing. And, and Amy, um, it, you, you did come away from, from that part of the hearing with the sense that she had held her own. Well, absolutely. And there were many people wondering whether it was a good idea for Republicans to have given this, um, the way that this hearing was set up, the way that it was a woman um, asking her these questions only gave her, it seemed to give her much more credibility um, and it, it took it away, too, from the partisan. There, there weren't Republicans going after her, making it look as if they had an agenda, and so it allowed her, then, to look like she was there just telling a story rather than trying to pursue some, something else, some ulterior motive. So speaking of the woman who was doing some of those questions for the Republicans, let's go now to another set of exchanges from the hearing. This is the woman who also took some of the spotlight today. She is Rachel Mitchell. She is a sex crimes prosecutor from Maricopa County, Arizona. Yes. The committee Republicans tapped her, and they ceded their time to her for all of their questions for Christine Blasey Ford, while Democrats used their time to question Blasey Ford directly. Now, later, some Republicans themselves questioned uh, they asked the questions themselves during Brett Kavanaugh's testimony, but let's listen to the prosecutor and some of her exchanges here. I want to talk to you about the day that this happened mm -hmm. leading up to the gathering. Okay. In your statement this morning, have you told us everything that you remember about the day leading up to that? Yes. Let me ask just a few questions to make sure that you've thought of everything, okay? Um, you indicated uh, that you were at the country club swimming that day? That's my best estimate of how this could have happened. May I ask, Dr. Ford, how did you get to Washington? In an airplane. Okay. It's, I asked that because it's been reported by the press that you would not submit to an interview with the committee because of your fear of flying. Is, is that true? Well, I was willing, I was hoping that they would come to me, but then uh, realized that was an unrealistic request. I also saw on your CV that you list the following interest of surf travel, and you, in parentheses, put Hawaii, Costa Rica, South Pacific Islands, and French Polynesia. Have you been all to those places? Correct. By airplane? Yes. And your interests also include oceanography, uh, Hawaiian and Tahitian culture. Did you travel by air as a part of those interests? Correct. Okay. Thank you very much. Easier for me to travel going that direction when it's a vacation. We all know that the prosecutor, even though this clearly is not a criminal proceeding, is asking Dr. Ford all kinds of questions about what happened before and after, but basically not during the attack. The prosecutor should know that sexual assault survivors often do not remember peripheral information, such as what happened before or after the traumatic event. When we left off, we were still talking about the polygraph, and uh, I believe you said it hasn't been paid for yet. Is that correct? Let me put an end to this mystery. Her lawyers have paid for her polygraph. As is routine. 
So, Michael Gerson, there were some attempts, clearly, by the uh, prosecutor, Rachel Mitchell, to try to uh, look for weaknesses in Christine Blasey Ford's explanations, whether it was how you're paying for your lawyers, you said you're afraid of flying. How much of a dent was made, do you think? Not much. Um, if the goal was to poke holes in the main story, um, I don't, I don't think it was very effective. She was consistent in her story. She had explanations for things that seemed natural. Um, you know, the tone of the questioning was not rude, or, mm -hmm. uh, and I think, right. but it would also did not seem particularly effective. Um, you know, the points like the flying point uh, seemed just as irrelevant to this as school yearbooks, in my view. Um, that, uh, so I think, that, you know, she spent some time on some blind alleys. Um, but uh, for the most part, I think her story held together. What about you, Liz Holtzman? Did, did, did it hold up completely in your mind? Yes, and actually, I think she strengthened her, the case about its being not politically motivated because she very much clarified the fact that she only came forward on this, and, and she came forward in a, in a secret way, she didn't want publicity about it, when there were other people being considered. In other words, it was a short list. She didn't come forward when he was the nominee. She came forward only when he was the nominee. She came forward before that, hoping that there'd be other, she said, there were other qualified people on the short list, and she thought that, that people should know, the president and the Senate should know, uh, so that he wouldn't be included on the short list. That didn't mean she had an anti-Republican or anti-conservative agenda. So I thought that became very clear. And I think the idea, I, I mean, I think this is where Brett Kavanaugh went way off, overboard. I mean, talk about a well-funded effort against him. She's going on online to, to, with a go, go fund me kind of campaign. She doesn't even quite understand what that is. And she's not paying for her lawyers. And she's had to raise money locally to pay for the security. So this is not a well-funded campaign from anybody else. So Amy, as you look at the Republicans' decision not to ask the questions themselves, but to turn it over to the female prosecutor, they called her a female assistant, woman assistant, um, did that turn out to be a smart move? Well, I think it was undermined when we got to the next section, which is when Brett Kavanaugh then took the stand, and or sat in the hearing. It's not a uh, trial in, the, in that way. He's not taking the stand. It looked but like one. It, <laughs> felt, it felt in many ways like one. And she started, uh, Ms. Mitchell started asking him questions in the same vein and in the same way that she'd asked of Dr. Ford. But then Senator Lindsey Graham took the microphone and made a very partisan uh, case against the Democrats on the committee, turned it completely away from Dr. Ford completely away from the events that happened that night and onto the way in which this story got into the press, how uh, it dropped at the last minute. And then from then on, every single other questioner was a Republican. We would then we, we went from what was a very, we just talked about, this wasn't really very partisan. This was sort of a, a, a very deliberative process in the morning to an absolute focus on partisanship in the second half. And it was all directed at Democrats on the committee and the way in which they held on to this letter and the way in which they, as they said constantly, dropped it, sprung it, ambushed them. It's almost as if we were lifted away from the partisanship for a, a brief period and, and then we went. plunged right back into it with Kavanaugh. So let's take a closer look now at some of Judge Kavanaugh's testimony. He came after Christine Blasey Ford. We played shorter clips of his opening statement earlier in the program. Here now is a longer selection. Shortly after I was nominated, the Democratic Senate leader said he would, quote, oppose me with everything he's got. A Democratic senator on this committee publicly, publicly referred to me as evil. Evil. Think about that word. And said that those who supported me were, quote, complicit in evil. I understand the passions of the moment. But I would say to those senators, your words have meaning. Millions of Americans listened carefully to you. Given comments like those, is it any surprise that people have been willing to do anything to make any physical threat against my family, to send any violent email to my wife, to make any kind of allegation against me and against my friends 
to blow me up and take me down. You sowed the wind. For decades to come, I fear that the whole country will reap the whirlwind. This whole two-week effort has been a calculated and orchestrated political hit, fueled with apparent pent-up anger about President Trump and the 2016 election, fear that has been unfairly stoked about my judicial record, revenge on behalf of the Clintons, and millions of dollars in money from outside left-wing opposition groups. This is a circus. This was an angry Brett Kavanaugh, Michael Gerson. Uh, he started, there were emotional points, but I think what we just heard were some of the angry moments, very angry, as we were saying earlier, at the Democrats. And, and putting this in perspective, saying hit job. This was a Democratic hit job uh, rather than some genuine. Uh, yeah, he, he came across at, at his best moments as defending not just his nomination, but his life, his character, his integrity, his family. Um, and a charge of, of sexual assault is a very serious charge. And he uh, reacted, I think, in a way that was deeply offended and emotional in those, in those sections. And he seemed utterly convinced of his innocence, you know, at every stage. That there were then some elements that were a little bit more over the top, um, particularly on the partisan side, and in his confrontation with some of the senators, where he just seemed to be throwing the dice and saying, what a lot of nominees would like to say in a circumstance like this and never would. Um, but, um, but so I, I think that, that those parts um, were maybe less effective, except maybe effective with a partisan group of Republicans. Um, yeah. but, uh, but it did humanize him in, in a completely different way than her testimony humanized her. Liz Holtzman, did he help himself with this? Well, I think he may have helped himself vis-a-vis -vis President Trump <laughs> because of his references to Clinton and his references to revenge and his references to the partisanship. But I think for a thoughtful viewer, they have to see that basically the position that um, Mr. Kavanaugh took was demeaning to the victim because what he's the alleged victim, because what he was saying was Basically, it's all orchestrated, funded by left-wing groups. She became a pawn in this process. What she, what, but if you listen to her at the beginning, you would see that she was a human being who had, whose whole life had been turned upside down by this, so, and who came across as very authentic. So I feel that people looking at this will see very partisan, very demeaning of the victim, and somebody whose temperament may not be the right thing for the U.S. Supreme Court. So we've got one more, as we've been discussing uh, during their questioning of Judge Kavanaugh, Democrats also zeroed in on the idea of an FBI investigation. Uh, it is something they've been pushing for ever since these allegations emerged. Now, Senator Dick Durbin of Illinois posed that question directly to uh, Brett Kavanaugh, which caused Republican Lindsey Graham of South Carolina to push back forcefully. If you, Judge Kavanaugh, turn to Don McGahn and to this committee and say, for the sake of my reputation, my family name, and to get to the bottom of the truth of this, I am not going to be an obstacle to an FBI investigation, I would hope that all the members of the committee would join me in saying, we're going to abide by your wish wishes and we will have that investigation. I, I welcome whatever the committee wants to do because I'm telling the truth. I want to know what you want to do. I, I'm telling the truth. I want to know what you want to do, Judge. I'm innocent. I'm innocent of this charge. Judge Kavanaugh, will you support an FBI investigation right now? I, I will do whatever the committee wants to. Personally, do you think that's the best thing for us to do? You won't answer? You know, look, Senator, I, I've, I've, I, I've said I wanted a hearing, and I would said I was welcome anything. I'm innocent. This thing was held held when it could have been presented in the ordinary way. If you wanted an FBI investigation, you could have come to us. What you want to do is destroy this guy's life, hold this seat open, and hope you win in 2020. You've said that, not me. You've got nothing to apologize for. 
when you see Sotomayor and Kagan, tell them that Lindsey said hello, because I voted for them. I would never do to them what you've done to this guy. Amy Walter, uh, this is what you were referring to a moment ago. Uh, Lindsey Graham very uh, upset on behalf of Brett Kavanaugh uh, and pointing your accusatory fingers at the Democrats. This is now gone, as we said. It's transitioned from a focus on what happened this night in 1982 to where we are in 2018, which is an incredibly polarized, emotionally raw country. And ultimately, I think what you saw during the Kavanaugh piece of, of today was an appeal from Republicans to other Republicans to say, we have one person who's saying they're 100% sure this happened, one person saying they're 100% sure it didn't happen. One thing we do know is what that Republicans are saying is one thing we do know is that Democrats sat on this. This is political. If you're a good Republican, if you support the party, if you support conservative principles, a person who's going to be a conservative justice, then you have to vote for Brett Kavanaugh. Because let's face it, this really all comes down to whether uh, Republicans can get 50 votes out of the United States Senate. They have 51 Republicans. And Michael, at this point, I know you haven't had a chance to talk to all 51 <laughs> Republican senators, right. but uh, you're somebody who has watched uh, this city for a long time. You watch how Congress works. What do you, what's your Well, I'll be watching sense? what those few members, like Senator yeah. Collins or Senator Murkowski or Senator Flake, right. want in the next stage here. Are they going to ask for something like a, a, you know, continued investigation of the other charges? Or are they going to ask for an FBI investigation or delay? That, I think, is, you know, they have disproportionate influence over this process right now, the marginal members um, that might be influenced. And so, uh, you know... I don't know. I, I don't know what the what the reaction is going to be. I mean, this was a Clarence Thomas reaction to the accusations. He went after. He did not go after the victim. He went after the committee, uh -huh. and he, you know, laid into them in a way that was talking about the politics of personal destruction and making it points about due process in his from his perspective. Um, and I think that that could rally a lot of Republicans and maybe alienate some other people. With so. Clarence Thomas, it was a high-tech lynching, he called right. it. And it worked. Uh, his and defense worked. His, in, that was his... his and, and today we heard strong language from Brett Kavanaugh about what was... But the only way you can call this a high-tech lynching and blame the Democrats is to demean the victim because then her integrity, her authenticity is meaningless. What they're saying is in, implicitly, I, I agree with you, they didn't say it explicitly, but implicitly their argument, the central thrust of their argument is she's a pawn in a larger political process and we don't have to pay attention to her. They're not saying it explicitly, but that's the thrust of their argument. But, but can't, Amy, can that... Does that work? Does well, it work we... to say, we respect her, we respect her story, but this is all part of a conspiracy, uh, a, a hit job? Right. That's what the, the calculus is, right? And that's why I think if you are Senator Mitch McConnell, you are with all of your Republican senators right now, and you're taking their pulse, and you're getting a sense for where, how vulnerable they feel to making this vote based on what they saw today. We know at least two to four of them said, I'm not going to make any decision until I see what happens today. So, as Lisa pointed out, there's still a hearing scheduled at 9.30 in the morning. Uh, it seemed pretty clear from the Republicans on that committee they want to take that vote. But McConnell knows that the, what the committee believes is not all that's... Imp uh, is not the end-all, be-all. They've got to find the rest of those votes. Yeah, the rest, the rest of the Senate. Uh, well, it has been uh, quite a day. I think this is one we're going to remember for a very long I time. I agree with that. Yes. Amy Walter, Michael Gerson, Elizabeth Holtzman. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You.